Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all the time. Uh, Puddles and I are here at Northwestern University with Gail Williams. I hardly think that uh, Gail Williams needs an introduction, but uh, just in case you don't know who Gail Williams is, former member of the Chicago Symphony Horn Section and professor of horn at Northwestern University, world-renowned soloist, pedagogue. Thanks for letting us come in. Oh, you're very welcome. And also uh, had some studies with Arnold Jacobs. That's correct. I'm just wondering, uh, do you recall uh, when, uh, you know, when you first encountered uh, Mr. Jacobs? I probably wouldn't be able to say the exact date. But I arrived here in January of. <coughs> uh huh, okay. Uh, okay, 74. <laughs> and had lessons with Frank Brock as a graduate student here. And started attending Nor the Chicago Symphony concerts as a grad student. And my two favorite people on stage were Bud Herseth and Arnold Jacobs. Mm -hmm. So I immediately kind of started getting a lesson here and there. I called and he said, we'll call later. And, and I called again and, I, and then he finally got to see me. Yeah. And my first lesson, of course, he said, oh my dear, you must breathe into these machines, you know. And I did it. I took a big breath and exhaled and he said, no, 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 my dear, you're doing this all wrong. So I took another big breath and, and exhaled as much as I could. He says, no, no, my dear, you must be doing this all wrong. Take a really big breath and exhale. So I did it again. He said, well, we have something in common. You have 2.8 liters and so do I, but I play the tuba. <laughs> so he, he kind of said, you know, you're the, you're the wrong shape to play a brass instrument. You have long legs and short torso. I said, mm. yeah. He said, but that's okay. You just have to be really good at what, you know, at knowing what you do. Very efficient. Yeah. And, yeah, right. And so that's how he changed my life. Wow. He really changed my life in the fact that he would say, change the phrase. Make the music and don't, and, and change the phrase. Do not sacrifice tone. And I say this probably a hundred times a week. And I have for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, do not sacrifice tone for the breath. Mm -hmm. Always protect your sound. Yeah, and I, of course, had many lessons with him. I saw him before I got in the Chicago Symphony. When I was in Lyric Opera, he, I remember going to a lesson, and he would say, you know, you must fill all the way to your collarbones. And that night I was watching on stage while sitting in the pit of Lyric Opera going, oh, that's what he meant when I saw a singer oh. take a breath in. It just went, boom, I went, oh, now I understand. So it was a really great relationship that way. And then I also, as a member of the Chicago Symphony, I still took lessons 10 o'clock a.m. on Saturday. And he would say, this is for you to practice, not to use tonight, and I will be watching. <laughs> in his big, melodious voice, you know? Yeah. And, but I also had the phenomenal opportunity to stand backstage at Orchestra Hall and there was a tiny, tiny little window in that back door and he sat right there and I just would stand there and watch him. Mm -hmm. I would close my eyes and hear his musicianship and his phrasing and the way he would could just blend and support that bass section mm -hmm. so well. But I couldn't hear the breath, but I, when I opened my eyes I could see it. Take a breath. Yeah, you could see the... So yeah. yeah, so you could see the breath, but the way he could release his sound, and that was, I think, one of the most impressive things. The way he could release his sound into the hall and take a breath and no one would know. So you had that immediacy of sound. Yes. Yeah. That seems to me that, that was a, that's a, one of the hallmarks of the Chicago brass, Chicago Symphony brass sound, is that immediacy. Yeah, I was told by Jake and also uh, Richard Olberg, you put the vowel on the downbeat, not the consonant. And I think that, he said, you know, articulation is the same as pronunciation. I'm, mm -hmm. sure, I'm sure you've heard this from mm -hmm. many other people. And he then would go on and talk like that, you know. <laughs> and you go, oh, okay. And when he would tell me, no, 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 you're using way too much tongue, I think. Me? I tell everybody, you're using way too much tongue all the time and not enough air, and that was really important to hear it, that, no, no, you still have to work at this. You know? mm -hmm. So I took many lessons 
with him um, on Saturday mornings. I had many lessons at Orchestra Hall, uh, hearing him, watching him, being with him. Um, and I also attended his master classes here at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what, uh, what was it like to play with him? Because sometimes I'm sure you'd be sitting maybe in the assistant principal position, right, you'd be right, right, right in front just of Just right, I mean, yeah. two feet away from him. In my left ear, I had Jake, and in my right ear, I had Eddie Kleinhammer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So that was pretty nice. <laughs> wow. What, 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 what do you remember? What, what's, do you remember? Maybe, you know, your first, your first few times in the CSO, just well, to hear that just right there. What was my that very like? first experience with the Chicago Symphony was um, when I was first in town, and I played assistant um, in Symphonia Domestica. And I was rather scared, mm -hmm. walking down the hall thinking, what the heck am I doing? Oh man! Mm -hmm. You know, I was playing the wrong kind of horn. I wasn't playing what they normally play downtown, and right. and uh, I wasn't studying with Dale. I was studying with Frank Brown. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking down the hall, and this is a little off of Jake, but I was walking down the hall, and I heard this unbelievable buzz behind me. And I was like, "Whew!" Buzzing the mouthpiece like that. It was Bud. Yeah. So between Bud buzzing his mouthpiece and Jake always pulling out his ring or his mouthpiece and buzzing, that basically changed my uh, way of thinking. So you uh, um, started to buzz your mouthpiece uh, maybe more uh, or, or probably with, or more, better quality. more and and thinking more about efficiency mm -hmm. and making it sound efficient and not work and. Jake and I always had a, a little bit of a, um, he would always smile and say in a master class, yeah, no, no, I don't believe in uh, really free buzzing. I think it's way too much lip tension. Mm -hmm. But I know there's someone here that does it. <laughs> and he'd look up at me and i just kind of put my head down. Uh -huh. Because um, my horn teacher in, in college, John Covert, got me to free buzz, and I believe it, this, not everybody should free buzz. Yeah. Some people can, some people can't. Um, I can. Yeah. And, and I did it in college because I grew up on a dairy farm, a la Holstein, mm -hmm. and I had to dri drive tractor. And well, you can't play on the mouthpiece and drive tractor. So I would play through all Mozart's and Strauss an octave lower. Yeah. And it, I think it really set things up. Yeah. And it maybe a little differently, you know? Well, you know, Jake was always, whatever works, you know, yep. as long as it sounds great, yep. play all wrong as long as you sound great. Right. But I know that he did encounter, um, in some of my lessons, he would t we would talk about that, and uh, he would say that he, he did encounter many people who needed helping because he thought that was at the yeah. one of the reasons but I think with the high brass it's a little bit it's somewhat different because the airflow is not quite as as thick as the low brass and but as long as it sounds great but, right? but if the 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 horn can be a blend between high brass and low brass which I think we really are well this is true yeah because you're right. we, we play in a register so often so low so yeah. low that we have to know how to do that too yeah. Yeah. Right. Gail, I'm wondering, um, you, you know, to m maybe the uh, less familiar folk, fam fam the folks who are less familiar with, with Jake, they know who he is, but they think of him as just, oh, he's that breath guy, that air guy. But to, in my experience with Jake, he was, uh, Mr. Jacobs was really the centerpiece was the music. I wonder what you, what you encountered with him in that regard. Well, I think, I think you're correct in thinking that everybody thinks he's the breath guy, but he was the, the ideal musician in the fact that the breath is the bow and that has to work so the music can get out. Yeah. And he was a very detailed man yeah, if you needed him to be. He was a really phenomenal teacher in the fact that he, he could read into everyone so much faster than you ever would expect. And he didn't do the same thing with everybody. Um, I remember 
getting ready to go to play at the International Horn Workshop in Germany. And I was going to play Adagio Allegro. And I thought it was really going well. And I went down and took a lesson with him. He says, what are you here for? I said, I want to play this for you. He said, okay. And I played it and he said, oh, my dear, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and this is like long into my orchestra career. You yeah, know? yeah. I was like, oh, cut the knees. But he was right. And he added so much music mm. to it, but again, making me efficient. So I could get the music out. Yeah. Because if you're all bound up, you can't get the music out. And he could work you where you're thinking the music and the breath has to go along with that great music. Yeah. The other thing that I remember going to him and he said, what do you want now, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was when, it was the first time I was going to play the Contrastuck with a CSO. And uh, I said, well, um, I have this high note that I have to play. He said, well, play it. I said, now? <laughs> and he, so he gave me this exercise that I use, you know, forever. And I, then I said to him, you know, it's a scale going da, 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 yeah. da, da, yep. but no tongue. It just, Go for the high E. I was like, yeah, right. And after I did that, and then, of course, you do it backwards. He said, okay, that's today. You do it one other time this week. That's like heavy lifting. You wouldn't go to the gym and lift weights really heavy every single day. Right. Don't do it here. And that was great advice because I, I use that all the time. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to do this every single day because you wouldn't go to the gym and do that every day. Mm -hmm. But then what I asked him, I said, can I flip that exercise for low? He said, sure, you can do that more often, but you can really get so you can play that first note of home maybe, and moving up the scale or whatever, and opening a faust, whatever you need to play. It's that it, you're creating a habit and a good habit. And that was his way of approaching music. Is he gave me so many other ideas of how to mm -hmm. do things. It seems like in your description that he really had a lot of respect for you, um, and, and he, he, he wasn't going to, but he wasn't going to let that respect get in the way of maybe finding a few things oh, to no. improve. Oh, no. Because his standards right. are so high. Right. Right. No, yeah. his standards were always high, and his, you know, as his health declined, he could still hear, mm -hmm. you know, and he still had wonderful thoughts, and uh, it was great to see him teach. It, what I what I took from his teaching, because um, I started seeing him probably that summer of 74 or 75, it was very soon, until he passed away, his teaching became more simplistic. Mm. And because sometimes you'd walk out of a lesson and think, ah, did I take the L or did I drive? You know, like my brain is so full. Yeah. But as he got older, he would say, I don't really care where the breath, how the breath, where it goes. Get it into your, past your lips. Right. And that is so important because I think too many people think, oh, I've got to get blah, 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 And they get Oops, choked up. Yeah. And he didn't really care. He just wanted to get that air in and out so you could use it efficiently. Mm -hmm. And then you could play the, the music. Yeah. I... I I often wonder, and I've said this on camera in a couple of other interviews this week, um, uh, but you know, with, with, with Mr. Herseth passing away fairly recently, it's, it's been on my mind. Um, I, I, can't, I, just ha I, I can't help but thinking that, that when, when Bud came to the CSO, you know, he came a few years after Jake, that Jake really found a soulmate, um, both musically and just from a production standpoint, just mind to the lip. And I'm just wondering if you have any any thoughts on that or observations or anything that might contribute in that regard. Um, Jake was a true musician. He I don't think there was one time that he wasn't singing on the trumpet. But and, I mean but, but and Jake was a true musician, but he wasn't ever singing because he was always singing. Mm -hmm always singing and he would sing in your lessons you could hear him singing when he was playing and bud when he wasn't playing he in the orchestra he was singing because mm -hmm. you could hear him 
Yeah. Really, he was singing the... Oh, he was singing the inner parts. He wasn't singing the melody of the symphonies. You could hear him singing all the inner parts and all the... You know, and as he got a little older, he would sing a little louder because his hearing wasn't quite as good. But it, he was always singing. He was always in his head. It was really interesting to sit there. And everybody thinks about, oh, Bud Herseth and this, the loud playing of that, you know. No. It was the Bud Herseth, the soft playing that made the hair stand on the back of your neck right straight up and go, ooh, baby, he's mm-hmm. on. You know. But, um, but I had a great relationship, and, uh, and I really felt like he was a father figure, mm. you know, very close. And he, uh, <laughs> we would be on tour, and they'd set aside a practice room. And of oh. course, Jake wasn't there, because you couldn't take the tuba, you know, so he would be probably on his mouthpiece. Yeah, he'd be in the room. But uh, I would walk in, and Bud would look at me and go, huh, you're back in the cheater's room, huh? Yeah, mm-hmm. I said, yeah. You know, because you just never know. Yeah. On tour, you, you have to be covered. And he was always saying, if I don't do my basics today, I will notice it tomorrow, and everybody will hear it the third day. Right. So, uh, throughout his whole career, you know, he, he thought that. And what I think really interesting about uh, Bud and, and Jake, they gave to the young students. Mm-hmm. You know, Jake always taught. Bud didn't teach a great deal in the university setting, but he gave to all the civic kids mm-hmm. and the trumpet sections. And and I played for him. And he was just always giving his, you know, giving back. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. Uh, Gail, um, uh, something I, that I've been thinking about over the many years is just the uh, the development of the Chicago sound, the brass sound in particular, um, and uh, the reading that I've done, the experience that I had when I was in Civic, was that there's this, it seems like there's this dead spot of sound at the podium. And so the conductor may be asking for more, and maybe it's too much, you know, re, you know but the conductor is saying more. I'm wondering if you, if you experience any of that. Well, you experience it because when you go to other halls, you realize, oh, <laughs> oh, is that what's going on in the orchestra? Oh. Because you can't hear anything else because at orchestra hall, it's really dry. So you wouldn't know that you might have something with a second flute. And then when you go to Carnegie, oh, you're with a second flute. And I think, I think, the, hall, I think the hall made the brass section play the way they did, not the sheer volume, but for the sheer resonance. Mm-hmm. Because in other halls, if you play that resonant, ooh, wait a minute, it's way too long. But I think it, it made us all play a certain style of air. Mm-hmm. And of course, when you have Jake back there and you can hear him breathing and you know what he's doing back mm-hmm. there, it, it makes you do the same. You mm-hmm. know? Um, but I think the hall did, did create a certain you know, brass sound, mm-hmm. as we would say. Uh, Schulte would say, this doesn't mean good, it means one forte. Right. You know, when, especially when we go on tour, because then he'd realize how loud we were really playing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, and, and you were talking about standing behind the, the stage door behind Mr. Jacobs. That, that one year that I was an artist assistant, as soon as I delivered the conductor and the guest artists to Bill Hogan, I would run around. Ah, yeah, yeah. And sure. I would, I just sat there and listened. Yeah. And and that was wow. That was a really great lesson in stage makeup, stage you know projection, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Because mm-hmm. it was, it was not the sound that I heard at that door, five feet away from those men, and uh, women was, it was so much different than what it was like in the gallery. That's correct. There was yeah. so much stuff yep. in the sound. Mm-hmm. It wasn't necessarily beautiful. Mm-mm. But it was amazing. Mm-hmm. I think what Jake's sound always got me was this complete resonance right here. And it was like you could hear the harmonics. And it wasn't low harmonic, it wasn't just high harmonic. It was complete, but a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that's what takes your sound. Yeah. And I think getting anybody to get that kind of resonance in their playing, you have to have complete efficiency again and I think that's kind of what I think the hall makes you do that Mm 
Mm-hmm. Because if you don't, you're not you're not going to get travel your sound at all. It's going to stay right on stage. You know, sitting so close to Mr. Jacobs, um, he, he would often say that he would change his bow often. He would try to do it in uh, places that were musical appropriate and just try to. It was a bit of a smoke and mirrors thing for mm-hmm. him. Did you very close? Did you notice that up close when he would be sneaking in and out and maybe you know shorter, much shorter phrases than oh, you would sure. expect? Sure, sure. But I don't think that you could hear it far away. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And Kleinhammer did the same thing. Oh really? Oh yeah. I mean, Kleinhammer had an exercise of crescendo, take a breath, sustain, take a breath, you know, sustain, take another breath, sustain, and then diminuendo. So you get so da, 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 so you would never hear that breath. And then he practiced that. Uh-huh. And and I don't know if he got that from Jake, but I know Jake made me do that in the lesson. Uh-huh. You know, so I think they, they kind of work, you know, at each other a little bit. But yeah, I mean, you have to, to sustain that kind of volume. Yeah, I think. I don't care if you have seven liters or two, you still yeah. have to take a breath. Right, right. And, um, and I think because he was always wanting efficiency, that he never let his breath get low, so he couldn't take an inefficient breath at back end. Right. And that's why he was just always topping it off. Mm-hmm. And, and he could take in a lot of air quickly. Oh boy, yeah. yeah. But it was just total just suction. Yeah. And not work. Yeah. Well, Puddles and I can't thank you enough for inviting us into your studio oh, here at Northwestern. And, thank you. And uh, um, uh, Puddles. Good luck with your, um, I, I do watch you in sports, you know. Thank you. Go Ducks. Yeah, yeah go All Ducks. Right. All right. I Hear do. that, Puddles? I do. I do watch you guys, yeah. Yeah, very good. Hopefully we won't have any NCAA violations. Too bad. Let's hope not. Well, or or we're going to get a phone call. Yeah, yeah. maybe so. Yeah. But uh, uh, Puddles and I wanted to uh, give you as a as a gift a uh, genuine University of Oregon duck jam made with Marion berries from the Willamette Valley. Thank you. We hope you enjoy this. Thank you very much. I'm and sure I will. We thank you so much for thank you. taking part. Yeah. And now back to you. <laughs>